His work expertly paved the way between the sounds of Norwegian folk music and the innovative techniques of the 20th century. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about Edvard Grieg. Edvard Grieg was born in June 1843 as the fourth of five children in a notable family in Bergen, a city on Norway's west coast that had close ties to the rest of Europe. His parents started music when he was six. His mother began teaching him piano in 1849. Her father, so Grieg's maternal grandfather, was Bergen's representative in the Norwegian parliament, and he had, unusually for the time, allowed his daughter to study abroad in Hamburg. She was an influential part of the musical scene in Bergen and instilled in her son a strong work ethic. He disliked piano lessons and exercises, preferring to figure things out on his own, but he later said that it was his mother's energy and work ethic that allowed him to continue on with his lessons even when he didn't like the lessons. He hated school and found ways to game the system in order to get sent home, usually by standing in gutters to get himself wet. This worked until one day he showed up to school soaking, and it was a perfectly fine day outside, so the teachers caught on to his little ruse. When Edvard was just about to turn 15, he met the violinist Ole Bull, a distant relative by marriage, who heard some of his earliest compositions and believed that Grieg's talents would best be developed in a conservatory. So off he went to the Leipzig Conservatory, founded the same year he was born, in order to study piano. Grieg grew to like Leipzig, and he enjoyed some of what he studied, but he found conservatory life, like his formal studies earlier in school, to be far too regimented. Grieg later wrote that he was truly sent off to Leipzig, and he felt out of place and homesick around some of the best musicians not just Europe, but the entire world had to offer. Musically speaking, he said that he felt he'd learned more by attending the rehearsals of the Leipzig Gewandhaus Orchestra, to which students had free admission to anything he learned at the conservatory. He said that he left the institution as stupid as he was when he entered. In his harmony classes, he bent and twisted the rules to include as much chromaticism as possible, and Grieg was convinced that his professors hated this practice of his, but the surviving documents show that they were perfectly fine with chromatic saturation so long as he still followed the basic rules of voice leading. Even 20 years after his graduation, when most students would look back on their student years through rose-colored lenses, Grieg wrote to his friend, Julius Röntgen, that the, quote, damned Leipzig Conservatory was to blame for his self-described lack of technique. Part of this issue was the culture of Leipzig itself, which was always more conservative than Grieg's more romantic, forward-thinking, innovative mind. The conservatory wasn't an objectively bad environment, it just wasn't suited to Grieg's temperament. He called himself a dreamer with absolutely no talent for composition, and he admitted that he was anything but teachable. Professors seemed to like him, though. They regarded him as one of their best students and noted that he worked hard on top of his natural abilities. Eventually, he realized that even though he didn't like to compete, he needed to compete, and he needed to make something of himself in Leipzig before he graduated, and so he threw himself into his work so hard that he ran roughshod over his own immune system. Before he turned 17 years old, he was struck by a combination of debilitating lung ailments, tuberculosis and pleuritis. The medicine of the time didn't know how to treat these. It didn't even understand really what they were. The best treatment doctors could provide for tuberculosis was a kind of early climate control. The sanatorium was a brand new invention, and the underlying bacteria that causes tuberculosis wouldn't be discovered until the 1880s. Tuberculosis was a death sentence. It was up to chance how long you could survive with the disease, and Grieg would survive for nearly half a century longer, despite permanent damage to his spine and lung. And yes, I said lung. He only had use of the right one because the left one had collapsed. His back was also permanently bent from this damage. Despite this setback, he graduated from the Leipzig Conservatory in 1862 and entered the musical world as a pianist and composer. His compositions theretofore had been largely for piano, with a few vocal and chamber works scattered in. While he played his own music to great success, including his Opus 1 at his final examination to leave and graduate the conservatory, he would later nitpick these pieces and even come to regret publishing them at all. To further his career, he spent several years in Denmark in the mid-1860s, and there met several composers, including Niels Gade, an important and influential Danish composer of the time who's largely been overshadowed by later composers. But Gade, for Grieg, was far too Mendelssohnian, and instead Grieg found himself 
hanging out more with Emil Hornemann, a friend from Leipzig, and together they formed a troupe of like-minded composers from Scandinavia who sought to move away from German Romanticism and towards more overtly Scandinavian influences. In 1868, Grieg wrote one of his most enduring works, the A Minor Piano Concerto. Not only is this a popular piece, it's also relatively early and is modeled in part after Robert Schumann's Sol Piano Concerto, which is also in the same key. Each begins with the piano, fairly unusual and a break with concerto form of the time, and neither have a completely orchestral exposition section. It makes sense, his teacher in Leipzig, Ernst Ferdinand Wenzel, the dedicatee of Grieg's Opus 1, was a friend of Schumann's, and Grieg had heard Clara Schumann perform the concerto ten years prior. But the concerto's enduring popularity is in Grieg's gift for imbuing his music with an indelible sense of Norwegian folk elements. When musicologists speak of musical nationalism, this is what they're referring to, explicit references to the styles and idioms, melodies, harmonies, instrumentations of a folk music of a specific people. The rise of musical nationalism was a defining feature for the latter half of the Romantic era and which stretched into the first part of the 20th century. Often the first composers who hit upon a unique style that also exemplified their homeland became famous for doing so. Although there were prior Norwegian composers, Grieg became that figure for Norway, primarily because he was able to be a Norwegian cultural ambassador by putting Norwegian folk music on a wider scale. He dressed it up and made it nice and put it in front of other cultures and other countries. It is for this reason that Grieg once said that he was sure that his music had a taste of codfish in it, referring to the Norwegian je ne sais quoi of his mature works. Hey, at least it wasn't Lutfisk. So what makes Norwegian music Norwegian? Well, for Ole Bull, it was in trying to reproduce the sounds of the Hardingfela, a Norwegian folk fiddle, on his own violin. This included the use of older modes, particularly the Lydian mode, and sudden shifts between modes, unusually placed dissonances, strong pedal points, and many appoggiaturas. The Lydian mode's characteristic raised fourth scale degree is sometimes found in an otherwise minor context, leading to this exotic augmented second, which is usually found in Western approximations of Middle Eastern music. Much Norwegian folk music is intertwined with the Hardingfela and exactly how it's played. It features four or five sympathetic strings under the fingerboard and no less than 20 ways to tune the whole thing. Its bridge, flatter than a western violin, allows for more sustained triple stops, and its bow is more baroque in its construction and playing technique in that it's lighter and has more of a bounce to it. Vibrato is largely non-existent, and modulation is unidiomatic, because the unique sound of the Harding Fela is generated by the resonance of the sympathetic strings. Going too far outside their tuning doesn't make it sound like a Harding Fela anymore. Since the two musicians were so close, what Bull brought to the table was immediately taken up and expounded upon by Grieg. Additionally, Grieg became friends with the sadly short-lived Rikard Nordrock, another Norwegian composer best known for writing the tune of their national anthem. 
It was Nordrock who finally pushed Grieg to abandon what Germanicism C picked up in Leipzig, and his own personal love of Wagner's music, and embrace a true Norwegian identity. It was Nordrock, Grieg said, that opened his eyes to the things in music that weren't music. In other words, what they didn't teach at the Leipzig Conservatory. So modes made their way into his work, as did the melodic and rhythmic elements of Norwegian folk dances. Harmonically, he was fond of blending modes and sliding between them to create contrasting sections. But perhaps the most forward-thinking aspect of Grieg's music is his use of parallel chords. Previous romantics had used diminished seventh chords, characteristically tight and symmetrical sound, in parallel motion. You can get away with doing this because these don't have any perfect fifths in them. It's all tritones and minor thirds. Grieg expanded this use of parallel motion to all sorts of seventh through thirteenth chords in all sorts of inversions. This was a result of his expansion of Norwegian folk melodies and trying to find the little hidden harmonic gems within them. A friend once told Grieg that he was born chromatic, and Grieg said that his use of chromaticism was indebted to how Bach, Mozart, and Wagner had used chromaticism to create moments of heightened expression. Chromaticism in Grieg is largely harmonic in that it's restricted to the inner voices and the bass. The melodies are often drawn from the styles and idioms of folk tunes, and some have regarded this, a descending second and third, as being common enough in Grieg's music to be called the Grieg motive. Despite his melodies and pieces being tonal, some singers have discovered that his music is a lot harder to sing than it looks, because even though the melodies are tonal, the harmonic contexts can sometimes be so chromatic that they can seem and sound atonal, even if he's just accompanying an otherwise straightforwardly tonal melody. He also used far more of the piano's sustain pedal than was common for the time, leaving some editors to cut it out and some performers to ignore it, because if you follow his instructions, it seems to blur the melody and harmony in ways that don't seem appropriate. But if you look closer, there's always a reason why Grieg would want this. In doing these things, Grieg exploited chords for their sound and not their implicit harmonic function, in much the same way that later Impressionist composers like Claude Debussy treated harmony. Because of this, Grieg is sometimes known as the first Impressionist. He was also fond of delaying the entrance of the first tonic chord of a piece, introducing it by way of an added sixth chord, or moving around harmonically by seconds and thirds as opposed to fourths and fifths. Debussy, however, was vocal in his lack of enthusiasm for Grieg's work, or at least he said as much. Maurice Ravel said that all of his pieces were influenced by Grieg and agreed with the English composer Frederick Delius that French music was just, quote, Grieg plus the third act of Wagner's Tristan und Isolde. Dilius, who admired and corresponded with Grieg, even quoted a selection from Grieg's Opus 66 in his own On Hearing the First Cuckoo in Spring. Grieg most frequently worked in miniatures, and most of these shorter works follow a standard ABA form which highlight his debt to the miniatures of earlier romantics who did the same thing. Grieg achieved success as composer, performer, and conductor, and often found himself juggling all three roles. Grieg was, according to some, going to be the premier pianist in his own concerto, but was unable to even attend the premiere because he was conducting in the Norwegian capital. The concerto was an international hit, and Grieg often found himself revising the piece, tweaking it here and there to improve it and overall make it more suitable to his final vision. His budding fame reached Franz Liszt, who successfully petitioned the Norwegian government to give him a grant to come to Rome, where Liszt was living at the time, so the two could meet one another. Grieg said that Liszt found his music appealing because of its national peculiarities. He'd successfully integrated Norwegian folk music into his own style, or at the very least he'd done something unique enough that non-Norwegians could point to it and recognize that there was something unique about it. Liszt's encouragement definitely bolstered Grieg's morale. He had perfectionist tendencies and could be reductive when talking about his own music. Others held him in higher esteem than he held himself, and he often found that his greatest successes lay outside Norway. Grieg had married his first cousin Nina, a soprano, in June 1867, despite vociferous objections from both sets of parents. They'd been secretly engaged for three years, and none of their parents showed up for the wedding. Grieg loved his wife's voice, and while she wasn't the strongest performer on the technical side of things, she was renowned for her interpretations, so his songs, and his mature work, were written for her to sing and for him to play. They had one child, a daughter, Alexandra, born in 1868, but she died at 13 months due to meningitis. 
The Greeks had wanted a large family, but their itinerant schedules and the lack of stable family life led to tensions in the relationship. Edvard left Nina in 1883. Their marriage was rescued in large part due to the efforts of Grieg's friend Franz Bayer, who also pointed out that they needed a stable home. Not to be an armchair psychoanalyst here, but most commentators seem to agree that it was the lack of domesticity that led to the tensions and brief splits in their relationship. But they got back together, which, you know, good for them. Illness continued to plague Grieg. Not only did he have still one functioning lung, which was continuing to degrade, and the back problems that I mentioned earlier, but he had horrible rheumatoid arthritis from his waist down, and he was also dealing with a chronically upset stomach. He enjoyed performing so much that he just pressed on through these health problems, in part because it was better than the alternative. Better to be down further south in Europe where it was nicer than spending a winter cooped up on the cold, cold west coast of Norway. While a large chunk of his music is either for piano or uses the piano prominently, given his background as a pianist, one of his most famous pieces doesn't include the piano at all. It's the incidental music to Henrik Ibsen's play Peer Gent, written expressly at Ibsen's request. This contains the famous, or infamous, In the Hall of the Mountain King, which frankly isn't really that interesting of a piece. I mean, it is effective at building up tension when you consider that a, it's incidental music for a play, not originally intended to be its own thing, and B, Greek himself complained that this music was, quote, patchwork, and that he was unable to write the pieces as he'd originally envisioned them due to restraints placed upon him by the theater director. He found it difficult to write the music. He called the subject matter terrifically unmanageable. It's because of Pierre Gent that Grieg never wrote an opera. He was working with Bjorn Stjerne Bjornsson, who was to be the librettist, on an opera about the ancient Norwegian king Olaf Tryggvason, but accepted the Peer Gint commission during a pause in their collaboration, which angered Bjornsson. As a result, the opera project never got off the ground. Grieg's fame as a conductor and his close ties to his hometown of Bergen led him to become the music director of the Bergen Philharmonic in the early 1880s. And when he reached retirement age, he was given a retirement pension from the Norwegian government not unheard of for famous Scandinavian artists. When Tchaikovsky wrote to Grieg in 1888, he said that there was a Grieg piece on practically every concert he attended, and indeed concerts of Grieg's music were almost always sold out and would necessitate extra dates added to accommodate the intense demand. Despite this, Grieg found that his music did not achieve critical acclaim to match its popular success. Which, I mean, fair, but it's much preferable to the opposite. I mean, I'd rather be Grieg than Ryan Johnson. Grieg pointed out, in response to critics who accused him of overselling his Norwegian-ness in his music, that Mozart and Beethoven had used German folk dances and music as their models, and no one was criticizing them of overplaying their Germanicness. Grieg believed in the ideals of the French Revolution and had a particular distaste for royalty. While he and his wife had performed for Queen Victoria and King Edward VII, he turned on a commission to write Edward's coronation march. He wanted the people to have as much say as possible, but considered himself a realist more than anything else. When Norway achieved independence from Sweden in 1905, he was in favor of the establishment of a Norwegian monarchy, if just for the interim period to make sure there was stability in government. While the Swedish government was not willing to fight to keep their union intact, the Swedish people were not too pleased that the Norwegians had decided to split. And Grieg actually feared for his life whenever he was in Sweden because tensions were just that hot. Although thoroughly a pragmatist, Grieg was more than willing to stand up for what he felt was right. When Captain Alfred Dreyfus of the French army was falsely convicted of treason and sentenced life in prison in 1894, Grieg was one of many celebrities, both national and international, who stood up to stop this miscarriage of justice. In Grieg's case, this meant declining an invitation to come to Paris, specifically citing the Dreyfus case as the reason why. This angered enough of the French public that he got actual oddness to goodness hate mail from French people, a lot of which described exactly, like, in detail, how they would hurt him if they ever found him. Some things never change. Grieg eventually did return to France, but only after friends convinced him that he could do so without getting beaten up. Tchaikovsky valued Grieg's music highly, likely finding something of a kindred spirit in someone who was willing and able to write gracious and tuneful melodies under sometimes very pressing circumstances. It's not a stretch to think that Grieg might have been on Tchaikovsky's mind when, four years after their meeting, Tchaikovsky was commissioned to write The Nutcracker under more significant restraints than Grieg had written his Peer Gint suite under. 
For Tchaikovsky, Grieg wasn't enslaved to systems and theories and composed with sincere artistic feeling. In 1906, Grieg met Percy Granger, who was an admirer of not just Grieg's music, but of Northern European culture in general, who was so fanatical in his love for all things Scandinavian that he sought to purge his English vocabulary of anything traceable to Latin or Greek. Granger was a notable interpreter of Grieg's concerto, which was one of the war courses in his repertoire. By their meeting, Grieg was quite sick and had been for some time. The following summer, he died from heart failure at the age of 64. Much like Tchaikovsky, Grieg's reputation after his death has highlighted differing interests and trends between the concert-going public and musical academia. It's both nationalist in its adoption of Norwegian idioms, but international in its inclusion of the kinds of music that he heard in his years in Leipzig, and his many travels to Denmark and elsewhere. He was criticized in his lifetime, paradoxically, for both being too Norwegian and for not being Norwegian enough. While his innovations might have been inspired by the music of his homeland, his personal idiom is far more innovative and daring than his lyrical miniatures might have you believe. And while it's true that he was never truly at home in larger forms, the influence of his music on later composers and the seeds it sowed for later, more daring developments is just now really being explored and appreciated. Mm -hmm.